Hey folks, how you doing? Uh, I went to the nursery this morning to pick up a bag of grass seed and I came home with everything you see in the back of the truck. So I thought maybe uh, some of you folks might enjoy, you know, just seeing some of the plants that kind of caught my eye and uh, maybe I'll talk to you a little bit about them. Um, I didn't prepare for this one, so, you know, I'm just going to try to give you a, a you know, a, a big picture overview and you're welcome to use Google if you want to, you know, get some more information about these plants. But let's have a look. So the first thing I've got here is uh, flowering cabbage and uh, some flowering kale. And I don't really use this very often. Uh, if I had like, um, like an estate I was maintaining or, or my own grounds, uh, I, would, I would buy these wholesale and put them in in the fall, like around the time the mums come out and just use them for, for winter interest. What happens is, is, is the cabbage and the kale actually um, tolerates cold weather and snow. So I can't say it grows during the winter, but it just gives you something interesting to look at uh, through the winter. So uh, when I'm filming this, it's actually, uh, it's, it's mid-October and this was all at the nursery I went to this was all on sale so I picked it up half off and we'll see how it goes um, but one thing I will say is if you're gonna plant flowering cabbage and flowering kale uh, don't wait to buy it you know as soon as you see it if you've got the inkling pick it up because it, it, it often goes uh, quite quickly and otherwise you just you just plant it in the fall it lasts however long it lasts and then in the spring you just rip it out and put something else in let me show you what I was thinking for this. So over here is a, um, it's a square foot garden I built maybe three years ago. And uh, it turns out I'm not as big of a vegetable gardener as I thought I would be. Uh, plus it's kind of shady here. We don't even get sun in this part of the yard. I mean, it's, uh, it's probably 11 o'clock now. The sun still hasn't made it over yet. But um, my thought was, you know, our kitchen window is right over here. So when you look out the kitchen window, you'll see the, uh, the flowering kale, flowering cabbage uh, in the garden. I thought that would be a nice touch. And usually when I plant this, if I wasn't going to, like I don't usually plant it this geometrically. If I was going to just use it for adding some color to the landscape, you know, I'd probably end up planting groupings of, you know, odd number groupings, three, five, seven, probably five would be the, the minimum for the most part. And then just mix your colors, you know. I, I really like that red, I think it's cool. The white looks a little bit phony to me, but at the same time, it, it adds some interest. So I usually use uh, like a two-third red to one-third white. And if I'm planning somebody's landscape, you know, you just do like a V pattern, offset rows. Doesn't have to be perfect, just offset rows. You know, the plants are gonna have some variation and let them fill in and just add some interest. Uh, with flowering kale and flowering cabbage, you really need to go kind of heavy on the, the amount you plant um, for it to make a difference. If I just stuck three here, it wouldn't have the same effect as, as if I put this many. This one is called Trisictris herta, or the toad lily. And, um, You know, this is actually the first year I've grown this. I planted some, I planted some of these last year and I totally forgot about them and we'll go, I'll go show you them in a minute. But they actually bloom at this time of the year. So there's a little bloom here and I just went for the straight species. The nursery, you guys see that? The, the other ones look much better. The nursery had a variegated one as well. But uh, these don't look like much now, but it, it, late season, uh, they're blooming. So it's, again, it's October. These are blooming. These are starting to die back. Again, there was a hybrid one at the nursery that wasn't dying back. I thought I'd try with the straight species. Told Lily, late season bloom, uh, and Google it because I don't really know a ton about it. But let me show you some more in the garden over here. So right here, this is a Told Lily. I planted last year and I just, sometimes I'll be at the nursery and buy stuff. 
and plant it just so I can remember they exist. Um, and I didn't realize they flowered this late. But uh, again, it's, it's mid-October and full bloom. So this is, um, this is Toad Lily Empress. Um, and it says right here on the tag, bloom time, bloom time summer to autumn. Now one thing about the Toad Lily is it says, uh, it actually says it grows in part shade to shade. And it looks like, I mean, this is, we're, we're under maple trees right here and under a, uh, a dogwood. Um, but one thing I want to point out as well is it says to keep the soil evenly moist. So I don't know if this plant is going to do okay where, you know, next year where, where it's growing now, because this to me is dry shade. Uh, so you want to keep it in a little bit of a moister spot. Um, but we had such a rainy year that I, I think that's why it's flourishing so well. But um, if you have a shady spot that the soil stays moist most of the year, um, you know, give it a shot. So the next plant we've got here is what's known as swamp milkweed. And um, I bought some of these about three years ago and I put three in my yard and I'll show you those in a minute or what's left of them. Unfortunately I don't really have water around here. I don't really have a consistently moist area. Um, but if you've got a spot and I think swamp milkweed will do okay um, if, it's, if it's got a little bit of shade and it's moist uh, like the edge of the water, uh, I think this is a good choice. But one thing I noticed is I brought three of these back and planted them and within an hour or two there was a butterfly flitting around. So they're going to eventually get to be three to four feet tall. I mean next year these will push three to four feet. Uh, they have a, a flower on top that's like a bunch of small flowers grouped together and um, butterflies love them. So if you're into, you know, attracting butterflies, uh, this is definitely one of the plants to have. Let me show you what I got. We're back under the maples again. Uh, the toad lily is over there. So again, like maybe two years ago, I put a grouping of three. I don't even remember where they were. And this is the only one that survived. And, um, you know, they get a pretty thick stem. A and I think the secret to these guys is to just have that consistently moist soil or basically not dry shade. I'm pretty sure I just did the, the worst possible uh, situation. But um, I'm not sure where I'm going to put the ones I got today because I want to think about it a bit and find something that's moist and like partial, partial sun. So we'll work on that. Our next plant is um, Aronia arbutifolia brilliantissima, uh, and this is called the chokeberry. And uh, I've never grown this one. Uh, I still remember when I was in school in the early 90s, you know, the teacher talked about this, and I think there was a slide of like a four to five foot shrub just covered in red berries. And I think there, there's a black version of this as well. I think at Yukon they have the black one back in the day. Maybe they have the red now. Um, but it was a really just, just covered in fruits and, and something if you want to attract birds, um, give the birds something to eat, you know, this is what you'd grow. So you can see now they've got, uh, you know, they've got the little berries, little fruits on them. And as this gets older, it's just absolutely covered and it gives the birds something to eat through the winter. I would swear the, the berries get a little bit bigger than this, uh, maybe once they're out in the landscape. And I did just do a quick search on this, and besides the nice berries, uh, this, the, the foliage is supposed to have a nice red color as well. Um, I looked it up in Durr, and um, you know, he said it's as bright as, as Euonymus alatus. 
in fall color. So this is another one, you know, I think I mentioned in another video, I've been trying to, to work more with nature than against her. So here's a plant that nature should enjoy over the winter. Uh, here a woodpecker making a bunch of noise over there. Uh, you know, nature should enjoy. And um, so I want to give it a shot and see what happens. So next we've got the leatherleaf viburnum, which I will do my best to pronounce correctly. Uh, viburnum ritidophyllum. And um, leatherleaf viburnum is kind of cool for a couple reasons. Um, the first reason is it does really well in dry shade. So it, it doesn't like take off in dry shade, but this will grow. The ravens just want to say hi. This will grow where um, a lot of stuff won't. Uh, the second cool thing about it is it's, it's semi-evergreen. So not all the leaves are gonna you know, stay over the winter, but most of them will stay over the winter. So it'll give you somewhat of a screening habit as well. So um, I've got a spot I'll show you in a minute where I put a couple in a couple years ago that were probably this size. And it's a really tough spot, and, and I think you'll get an idea what I'm talking about. Um, it does have a flower in the spring. It's not really like as showy as like a double file viburnum, but it will have a, a nice flower in the spring. You know, the foliage has this glossiness to it. It's pretty cool. Um, if it's a wet year, you'll often see some blooms later in the season. Um, so this is just, to me, a really cool shrub. Um, dry shade, screening plant that's not just like an evergreen rhododendron or something, or a needle-leaved evergreen. Try a little leaf viburnum. Okay, so we're actually in my neighbor's yard now, looking back at my house. And in front of me are some redunculously old uh, white pines. So this is a pretty shady spot. And I mean, you see the size. So the ground here is just littered with, with white pine roots. So I planted these um, leatherleaf viburnum a couple years ago, and they were probably the same size as what you see in my truck. And are they huge? No, you know. Are they full of foliage? Not really. I mean, they thinned out. There's not a ton of light or water here. Um, but are they growing and do they look decent? Yes. Uh, and that's just one thing to consider if you're going to grow a, a leatherleaf viburnum. And, and what's happening here is they're leaning towards the light. The morning light comes from this direction. So if we walk to the other side, you would just see like a, you know, a, a more bare looking shrub. Um, but it gives me that, again, that backdrop I talk about in a lot of my gardens. I like to create a nice backdrop. So leatherleaf viburnum. Uh, dry shade, you want to create a backdrop, it's not going to grow fast in dry shade, but it is going to grow, and sometimes that's half the battle. So if you take a look, we're on the other side now, and you can see how the sun's not doing too well, but the back of these shrubs is, is kind of bare. This one is, you see how it's leaning towards the light. Um, there's not much foliage on the back, but they're giving me that, uh, they're giving me that backdrop. And then our final contestant today is, um, this is Viburnum dentatum, uh, arrowwood viburnum. And there's, um, there's a lot of cultivars of this which are, are more beautiful. Uh, there's one called Blue Muffin, it's quite popular, and there's another one called Chicago Luster. Uh, so this is just the straight species. And I remember this one again back from the early 90s in plant ID walking around the campus and there was a group of this and it was probably 10 to 12 feet, maybe even 15 back then. 15, it was just a very upright shrub. Uh, and I said, why would somebody want to plant that? You know, it was kind of ugly. Um, but the cool thing about the arrowwood viburnum and with Chicago luster and um, blue muffin is they have just a ton of berries uh, in, the, in the fall, summer, fall. I think it's the summer. 
So again, this is more for your birds, give them something to eat. And, and again, the cultivar's blue muffin clearly has some blueberries on it. But um, if you're naturalizing, you know, if, if somebody just knocked down your forest to build your house and you want to naturalize, um, pretty tough shrub. I've never grown it before, but I want to, again, support the local wildlife. So we're going to put some in. This is going to go in a, what I consider my backdrop planting behind my house. Uh, I'm going to put them in there and just see if they, uh, see if they survive. Um, I did not know today was a half day. See if they survive um, in the woods. All right, folks. Well, unfortunately, the back of the truck is empty. Uh, but if you could do me a favor and just go ahead and hit the like button down there. Leave me a comment. You know, tell me what your favorite shrub was. I don't know. Anything you want to add to the content. Uh, I think a lot of times the comments, uh, if you go down and scroll through them, um, you know, you can always learn something because there's always somebody that knows something you don't. Uh, so have a look. But please do hit the like button. Uh, if you're not subscribed to the CT Scaper YouTube channel, just go to Google and, and type CT Scaper YouTube and you'll find my channel. Uh, subscribe. And um, thanks for watching today, folks, and I look forward to seeing you soon. Take care.